A helicopter carrying a small crew of WWF scientists lands high on a remote plateau. They're hours from anywhere. The rocky platform is inaccessible to humans by foot, but the team are out to find if any wildlife has survived after a blazing fire ripped through the area. Dr. Keita Ashman and the team slowly push through regenerating bushland, deploying cameras that will take a picture of anything that moves. As Keita pushes a path through shoulder height scrub, she reaches a clearing, exhausted. But there, high on a rock, sits a pyramid of poo, fresh. Wombats are here. Life finds a way. I'm Carlo Ritchie, and this is Scat Chat with WWF. Join me and WWF as we get to the bottom of what fascinating things scat or poo can teach us about the animals that make, the homes they live in, and the problems they face. We'll also chat about what you can do at home to help your favorite animals thrive in the wild. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Keita Ashman. Let's talk about wombats, Keita. This is going to sound like a crazy question for someone who spends all day working with them, but what is a wombat? What does it think? What is it like? How does it taste? They're pretty cool. They're like this little block Duplo, really solid looking animal. Super cute, very furry, medium brown kind of colored, big kind of head. Um, and they're herbivorous. So they eat like leaves and grass and, you know, more grazing herbivores. All right, Keita. So it's scat chat, which means it's time to talk about scat. Tell me a little bit about wombat poo. What does it look like? So wombat poo is pretty unique because it's cubed. They are the only animal that has that weirdly cubed, squarish looking poo. So the only animal in the world. The only animal in the world that has cubed poo. It's very cool. So when you see it out in the bush, it kind of looks a bit like chocolate covered licorice cubes. <laughs> chocolate covered licorice has come up a lot in Scat Chat. Like it seems to be the go to reference. I mean, it's a pretty solid reference point. I feel like everybody's had it at a certain point. Everyone can picture it in their mind, but it's about, you know, two centimeters long. You're looking at about, you know, an inch by an inch roughly of cubes. And they're often, you'll come across them in weird places in the bush, all around the place, up on like logs, on top of rocks, um, usually a little pile of them, of these little cubes. They've created these little like poo forts that just sit on top of these <laughs> things out in the forest. So, Do they really, like, they build little poo castles? It's a little Lego characters in there that's the giveaway that they're doing this deliberately. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so what are some of the weirdest places that you found wombat scat in the wild? I've found wombat scat in some weird and wonderful places. So other than just kind of up on a log or pretty high up rocks, um, I was out doing some camera trapping surveys with uh, the WWF Rewilding Australia crew. So we actually had the privilege of working with New South Wales National Parks who helicoptered us into this remote high elevation plateau. And so the thinking was if we've got to get helicoptered in, it's probably pretty hard for things like cats and foxes to get up onto that plateau. And so we wanted to put out these remote sensing camera traps to see if we could detect any cats and foxes. And then if we don't get them up there, it could potentially represent like an island in the sky that we could kind of help to restore and, and put critical range animals back in. I had the backpack full of camera traps. I think I'd deployed maybe two or three cameras already and it was thick, dense bush, virtually like swimming through some of this, these areas, like very difficult to move through. And we dropped down from the main top part of the plateau down to these really rocky areas, still very difficult to navigate, really remote. You know, we'd chop it in there and I was kind of looking for a new area to put the camera trap and this is wombat poo. There's this little pile of wombat poo on top of this rock. I'm like, I got choppered in here. How are you here? How has this happened? So I think at that point I started to think like, man, they can get anywhere. Do you think it could almost be like an observer's paradox? Like because they know that people are looking for their scat, they've started making it a little bit more interesting for the scat finders. They go, oh, yeah, Keita will enjoy this one. <laughs> this one's for you, Keita. No, yeah. 
I think it's probably just that you come across wombat scat in places all the time in places where you're expecting to find it, but then there's a handful of occasions where you come across it where you're really not expecting to find it as well because there's such a like robust, fairly, you know, heavy animal that doesn't, you know, doesn't get around easily in terms of like getting up and down between places. They're fast, but it's more those moments where you come across it and you're like, this shouldn't be here. Why is this here? <laughs> I just want to talk about their speed, right? Because I've heard, and this may be a myth, that they are faster than Usain Bolt over a 200-metre distance. I've heard this too. Is it true? Yeah, in my mind it's true. <laughs> I'm not sure there's been like verifiable or peer-reviewed studies uh, that like exist in the literature to say, yeah, this is definitely a thing, although – you know, someone's come up with that figure somewhere. So I, I suspect that it's potentially a figure that's been like extrapolated out. Like they can cover this right. distance to this distance over this period of time. And so if we kind of expand that out, they would theoretically be faster than Usain Bolt. So is this the point when you start tweeting Usain Bolt and trying to get in his head and going, okay, <laughs> you wombats are faster, man. Maybe you're going to have to come and test this out. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I've privately been doing that uh, for the last like how many years, but sorry, Usain. <laughs> You got about a hundred fake accounts, like yeah, all exactly. different Each pseudonyms. with like a different wombat themed pseudonym yeah. and like different DP of a wombat. I, at I poo on rocks. At wombo coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the follow up question: How do they become cubed? Why? Like, why are these cubes forming in only wombats? It's an interesting question and it's a question that scientists have only kind of recently been exploring so the first lot of research that looked at this question why do wombats have cubed poo that came out in 2018 and scientists had basically gotten hold of a couple of wombats from tassie that had been hit by cars and they dissected them to have a look at what was going on internally and what type of structures might be contributing to them having this cube-shaped poo. Because in the past, people have thought, oh, they've got a cube-shaped bum <laughs> and, like, all this stuff that, like, mm, probably doesn't really check out. So there's, like, a few factors that are at play that that contribute to them having square poo. So one, they're herbivores. So the poo, the food that they eat takes a long time to actually go through their digestive system. So it can be up to like 10 days. And Gee so is. it's sitting there for a long time. They have a certain shaped uh, lower intestine, I believe, that squeezes in a non-uniform way. So because they're Herbivores typically don't have a very nutritious diet. They're trying to extract all of the nutrients they can out of what they eat. And the gut, when they looked at it, had different thickness in certain areas, different rigidity in certain areas. And it's in the last, I think it's 8% of that actual process of the food moving through their intestines when it becomes a solid, when it goes from liquid to solid. that. Right that intestine kind of compresses it and squeezes it and turns it into that cube shape. Ah, the cubery. The cubery. And then the top and bottom is just from those poos kind of compressing and being on top of one another. So it's all happening internally. You think when you run a podcast that's about scat that the facts would start to not impress you, but I just cannot stop by being impressed by animal poo. Yeah, guess it's- again, Carlo. There's a lot to learn about animal poo. <laughs> <laughs> also, like 10 days to digest, that's a very long time. It's a really long time. It would explain why the poos are in such incredible locations. They've got 10 days to start thinking about yeah. where yeah, it's going to yeah. come out. They're like, oh, I'm going back to that log. Bookmarked that little bad boy. Other than being very cool, what does Wombat Scat tell us? Wombat Scat, I mean, there's... Obviously, we can look at things like diet, which can tell us a bit about their habitat use, uh, can tell us a bit about the types of things that are growing in the forest. One of the ways in which wombats will actually use their own poo and one of the thinkings behind why they might have developed or evolved this cube-like poo shape is to actually be able to use it to kind of mark, like this is my territory, this is my area, because if they're pooing on rocks and they're pooing on logs and things like that, normal kind of round poo is more likely to roll away. And so they'll often poo as a signal to other wombats, hey, this is my turf, back off, 
Or if it's a lady wombat, she might be pooing to say, hey, come and sniff my poop because I'm <laughs> ready for a, a lovely gentleman to come along and make some baby wombats together. You see my poo fort up on that rock? Yeah, I climbed there. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine the lady that's pooing those out, boys. Exactly. Come and find her. The thinking is that they use their poo to send all of these kinds of messages to one another. And I guess from a evolutionary process, wombats who had more rounder poo if their poo is rolling away, a rival male is not getting that signal, hey, I already live here, you might get more fights, that could potentially equal more fatalities. So there's a lot of ways in which wombat poo can be used, I think, within the species themselves, ways that they're sending messages to one another. Now, I wanted to talk to you about the wombat-powered recovery. To me, it sounds like we're going to use wombats as a fuel source. I mean, it's not like completely... Totally off the mark. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. I knew I've been hoarding all those wombats for a reason. Yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're definitely not completely off the mark. So um, Wombat Powered Recovery is a project that we are funding and we are working with researchers from Charles Sturt Uni to look at whether or not uh, wombat burrows and having wombats in landscapes helps wildlife recover after disturbances like the bushfires that we had in 2019 and 2020. Right. So they were basically looking at a whole different range of uh, wombat burrows across different fire severities and then deploying camera traps to look at what other animals are using their burrows, how often are they using them, are they using them more frequently in areas that were harder hit by the bushfires or is it pretty uniform, and just trying to get a better kind of baseline for this is exactly the type of role that wombat burrows are playing in the landscape. We do already have a fair bit of research on that, but this is a new way of basically valuing this ecosystem engineer, which is basically an animal that changes uh, some of the functions of the landscape by digging, um, often by cycling nutrients through it. So, yeah, there were those stories of wombats, you know, herding animals into their burrows and doing all this, you know, the great saviour wombat. But mm -hmm. we know that that's not necessarily the case, but they might be accidental heroes. They might be these animals that are already basically digging and creating these refuges during bushfires and then after bushfires when there's not much complexity left on the ground and animals could potentially be using these burrows as a place to hide from predators or to get into you know a cooler spot um, when it's really hot and there's not much left on the ground after the fire. And what sort of animals are we talking about when when you you mentioned that animals are using these burrows? Are these just small creatures or? No, it's a pretty big range. So um, we've had some preliminary results, which are really exciting from Charles Sturt Uni crew, and they've got a whole range of things using these burrows. So a whole lot of different birds, um, reptiles and lizards, monitors, bush rats, antichinus, wallabies having a look, echidnas. Yeah, there's quite a range of animals that are using these burrows in various different ways. So they might be going into the burrows and hanging out in them for a bit. Um, we've had quite a few just coming and having a look and investigating them. Then there's been others where after a downpour or some rain, the burrows or the edge of the burrows is filled up with a fair bit of water and we've got lots of animals like wallabies and stuff coming and having a drink. So there's probably quite a few different ways that the burrows are actually playing an important role in the landscape and the ways in which these different animals are using them are kind of going to be used as an indicator for the different ways in which they're important. So are wombats then, do they have a... a, a a high survivability in these extreme events like bushfires and things? Are they less affected than animals like koalas? Yeah, absolutely. If you think about the way in which a bushfire moves through, um, if you're able to go underground and there's been certain studies that have found like wombat burrow systems, so like warrens can be like 90 metres long, not necessarily all meters. the way down, but yeah, 90 metres of, of burrow of like that warren system. So they can be quite extensive. Um, and so depending on the burrow, depending on the individual, there's potentially some really cool like buffering capabilities of these types of structures in the landscape. So you would expect 
a wombat to be much better off in a typical bushfire scenario than, say, a koala or anything like that that's kind of up in the trees and maybe a bit less mobile. So in the case of these massive 90-metre warrens, do they share that with another wombat? Are there like a couple of wombats using that or is it just, this is my turf, you stay out? So from what I've been reading, they're solitary animals, but they do typically have a few warrens on the go. And so what seems to be the case is one wombat will be using one burrow, but they might actually rotate through, say, three or four warrens. And when he's in that burrow, the holiday house is getting used by someone else. And, you know, it's a bit of a rotating kind of Airbnb situation with these with these warrens, I think. Besides other animals using these burrows, what are some of the other benefits that they have? I mean, do they have benefits for the environment? Yeah, yeah, they definitely do. So there's been uh, quite a bit of research in the past that's looked at the thermal properties of these burrows. And so people have used all kinds of cool ways to deploy these little kind of, they're called uh, eye buttons and they just record the temperature kind of on a rolling basis. This piece of research that we are collaborating with Charles Sturt Uni on is wanting to look at ways in which these burrows might create a more resilient landscape. So we know that there are wombats, you know, across millions of hectares across Australia and that they're creating warrens and burrows right across the nation um, where they're found at least. And so if they're able to create these burrows that are being used by a number of animals, which we, we know that there are a, a whole suite of species that are using them, and if they represent an area that might be more climate resilient. So if you imagine like hobbit homes, go to Hobbiton. You don't have to ask me <laughs> twice. So when it's a hot day, people will go to ground and those types of structures we know through time with our human settlements and hobbit settlements, they're more buffered from the external temperatures. And it works on the same principle with wombat burrows. So the deeper you go into the burrow, the more thermally uh, buffered you'll be from the outside environment. So with climate change, we know we're going to get hotter temperatures. We know we're going to get more frequent and severe heat waves. We know we're going to get more frequent and severe fires. And so all of those things are going to create a uh, more hostile environment for a lot of these animals to live in. So if we have wombat burrows throughout the landscape, then that offers a few different things. So they can go into those burrows for shelter on those really hot days. If we have a bushfire come through, they can potentially go into those bushfires and hopefully survive, particularly if it's a low or medium severity fire. And then after the fires have come through, what typically happens is predators will invade those landscapes. So foxes and cats, even ravens and other kind of aerial predators, they'll all come in because a lot of the complexity with shrubs and grass and everything, trees is all reduced. And so anything that's left in that landscape is just sitting duck waiting to be snaffled up by a fox or a cat. So if they can move into those burrows or at least you know, scurry into them when they need to, when a fox or a cat is spotted, then that can also create like a natural refuge. And the cool thing that this wombat powered recovery is kind of looking at is all those different ways in which the wombat burrows represent value in the landscape. And for an animal like wombats, who is still relatively common, but is still persecuted quite a lot, particularly in agricultural landscapes where they create that human wildlife conflict. If we can prove, hey, these guys are really important and they're actually providing a really important ecosystem service over millions of hectares across Australia, and this service could be really important going forward with climate change when we know it's going to be much more difficult place for a lot of our nature to kind of survive and thrive. So how threatened are wombats? They're still pretty common, thankfully. There's a bit of science out there to suggest that they are declining from certain areas or they're not in areas where they used to be. As far as their current conservation status goes, they're still considered not threatened. For most of them, there are different subspecies of wombats that are in trouble. But if we're talking about the common wombat, which is what we mostly have been, they're doing okay as far as their conservation status goes, but they're experiencing the same threats that a lot of our threatened wildlife is. And that overarching threat that I was talking about with climate change, 
is a pretty scary one for wombats mm-hmm. because when you start to look forward, what's the environment going to look like in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, 30 years' time, it looks very different. And we've got, you know, more bushfires, more severe bushfires, hotter weather. So what are some of the things that we can do to help wombats? Obviously, combating climate change is something that everyone can contribute to, but what are some of the personal choices we can also make? Personal choice wise, you know, you're right. Climate change is something that we all need to pitch in. We all need to do what we can in our own backyards, but also just in the way, in the decision making that we do. It's important that our governments take action on climate change and that we support them to do that. Personally, I like to eat as many plant based meals as I can. And so reducing the impact that you have on the planet or how much of reliance you have on practices that might reduce the amount of habitat that's out there, I think is another one that people can do. Limiting plastic for sciencey people that are really interested in helping out wombats and all other wildlife, um, you can head to our Scat Chat website and there'll be a link in there that links you through to our Innovate to Regenerate project. And that will give you all the details on how to apply for a grant, what's involved with that, what we're kind of looking for. But the cool thing about this Innovate to Regenerate program is we're trying to unearth some really new, out of the box, but uh, impactful ideas to help wildlife like wombats and a whole range of other critters um, and unearthing some solutions that we might not have thought of that we'd be keen to collaborate on. Now, I try and eat a wombat every year for Christmas. Would you say (laughs) that that's something that I should stop doing, Keta? I mean, it's probably not a great idea. (laughs) Before we wrap this up, Keta, One of the things that I like to do here at Scat Chat is to talk about some of our favorite scat facts. Now, these don't have to be about wombats necessarily. Do you have any other fun scat facts you'd like to share? Well, I guess it's, I don't know if it's really a fact or it's more something that like, I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of. This is what I need. This is what I love. I'm just going to drop the knowledge on scat. I worked on koalas for a long time. They are folivores, meaning they only eat leaves uh, primarily for their diet and leaves are not very nutritious, (laughs) especially Mm. eucalypt leaves. Oh, I got very sick the year I only ate eight leaves. Yeah, you would not be eating your wombat for Christmas that year. You would be, (laughs) no. (laughs) So eucalypt leaves, they're not nutritious, but then on top of not being nutritious, they also have all of these uh, properties about them, like anti-herbivory properties that make them toxic. And so koalas are trying to eat a very low nutritional diet that is toxic for them. (laughs) And so when they eat leaves, it takes a really, really long time for all of that to break down in their gut, similar to wombats, probably a bit longer than wombats actually. And they develop this gut microbiome. They develop it by having what's called fecal pap, (laughs) which is this pooey substance that the mums will excrete for their babies to eat. (laughs) Just a little bit of poo to eat. Just a little bit of poo to eat. (laughs) So mums give their babies or will excrete for their babies this magical poopy juice, (laughs) which is basically like the most supercharged kombucha that this baby koala can get that gives it all of the gut bacteria that it needs to go on slowly poisoning itself from its very <laughs> low nutrition diet. <laughs> Give it 10 years and this will be the new superfood, Keta. Oh, it's already, yeah. P- researchers are already doing like poop cakes and the cra- <laughs> crapsules. Have you heard about crapsules? There's, yeah, it's a whole thing. <laughs> My interesting little scat fact, you may or may know this, but Elephants can produce up to 100 kilos of dung per day. Yeah, incredible. Oh, you're already, you're already all over this, Keto. I was Googling scat facts and I saw the elephant one pop up and I was like, I can do better. <laughs> do you know as well that it's 100 kilos of poo, but it's also diamonds? So there you go. They poop diamonds. Yeah. I think you're making that up. If you leave it out in the sun long enough, they become diamonds. So, yep, that's just a fact I'm you didn't know. that's not science. <laughs> Dr. Keita Ashman, thank you so much for coming on today's Scat Chat. It was terrific to talk to you about wombats. And, yes, keep finding those cubes wherever you can. Thanks, Carlo. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me for Scat Chat with WWF. If you want to find out more about how you can submit your innovative ideas to help wildlife, 
Head to www.org.au forward slash scatchat to get involved and follow us here to stay in the loop. Join me next time as I get to the bottom of the incredible story of a wallaby that was thought to be locally extinct until an exciting scat discovery suggested otherwise. 